What's up, everybody? I am back uh, for the second time in a week. Um, and this week, or on this particular episode, I should say, I am talking to Terry Ellis of Pursuit of Perfect System, um, a high-end, hi-fi specialist channel, uh, one which I followed for a, a pretty lengthy period of time before I had the opportunity to meet Terry and you know, have since uh, developed a pretty good rapport with him. So it was fun catching up with him about high-end, hi-fi. Uh, and we did a, a virtual tour of my hi-fi rack for everybody who's been requesting it uh, there's been a few updates made um, and uh, I also felt rather than me uh, kind of ramble on in a uh, expletive laden monologue as I did uh, on the last special um, I would have a, I would have a true specialist uh, on with me and um, you know Terry is a guy who knows an awful lot about this is you know has really kind of you know I mean look not really has literally dedicated his life to the hi-fi game um, and uh, so if you if you're interested in buying some new stuff or you are interested in upgrading your new um, or your existing uh, hi-fi set or uh, you know you just uh, an enthusiast and uh, intellectually curious uh, individual like myself um, definitely make sure that you follow his channel um, and uh, for sure make sure that you uh, that you pay attention over the next uh, hour and a half or so because you may learn something um, for those of you new to the channel all the usual uh, announcements apply please hit the subscribe button on wherever you consume your podcasts whether that be YouTube um, Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, CastBox, TuneIn Radio, Deezer, or wherever else. Uh, follow the show on social media. Head to the Into the Necrosphere Teespring store if you want to buy yourself some uh, swank-looking goodies. Um, and um, do come back next week because I'm going to be talking to Katie Irizari of Season of Mist. Um, so uh, I suspect that is going to be a particularly enjoyable and spicy conversation. Katie is not someone to hold back her opinions. Uh, it was a blast having her on back on, I think it was 30, episode 36 or 37. Um, and I thought it was high time that she was uh, that she was coming back. So she's back uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, in the meantime, um, get your uh, get your nerd goggles on. Uh, this is a virtual tour of my hi-fi rack with Terry Ellis of Pursuit of Perfect System. So uh, Terry, you're uh, you one of the first truly non-metal folk to be invited on the most metal of podcasts, but I, I think you're also one of the folks that's 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 non-metal who I've spoken about most on the show, often obviously in very derogatory terms and you know with with loads of swearing and insults and stuff like that <laughs> bundled in. But welcome to uh, to into the necrosphere, mate. Um, yeah, thank you. Well, I've got I've got to say when we first met when. Uh... When you started listening to metal music, that was one of the biggest uh, <laughs> surprises, actually, funnily enough, because younger guys looking at very expensive or very high-end hi-fi, expecting you to throw on some classical music, and you couldn't have thrown on something really quite uh, more extreme at yeah. the other end of the scale to that. So, uh, Well, dude, I mean, so when, when we first met, it was at the first um, demo event that I went to uh, at Nendronix, and, um, you know, I, I kind of... I was I was really only still getting into the hobby at that point, um, you know, and uh, you know, absorbing as much as I possibly could on YouTube and everything else to to kind of you know learn you know what 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 you know what I should be looking for. So you know, seeing you for the first time in person was like seeing a celebrity, <laughs> so, and it's been great that you know since then we've uh, you know we've built a pretty good rapport and. You know, it's uh, especially you know it's a shame. Obviously, we don't get to do the hi-fi shows and stuff like that anymore. But uh, you know, it'll be it'll be once once that lifts and things goes go back to normal. Hopefully, we see each other a bit more regularly. Should be soon. Should, uh, I put my teeth in. It should be soon, shouldn't it? It should be hopefully at least one this year. I'm expecting. Well, yeah, it looks like Ascot is going to happen, right? Well, that's what I was hoping. I mean, I, I mean, funnily enough, I, I haven't got my hopes up for that and haven't made any plans, but. I was thinking September-ish, isn't it? Late September, I think, is when it's planned for. So fingers crossed. I think yeah, we, I think it was something like the 25th of October because is Andre October, and I spoke about it this morning and oh, okay. we were saying, because he's he's just had to go to South Africa uh, for family reasons. So he's kind of like smuggled into the country practically. Um, but the plan was that he's going to come back right before then. Um, and then I said to him, like, rather than last year where we had to rush through it, you know, we'll, we'll get a hotel in Ascot and, and, you know, do like two full days. You know, and really be able to spend some good time there. Well, it's easily a show that's worth two days purely because it's spread out. And what I find with hi-fi shows, it, even when I'm there just working, you're trying to cover so much in a short space of time. The problem is you don't relax. So you go into a room and the whole time you're in there, you're thinking, well, uh, you know, 
how much else am I going to see in this day? And then, and I feel like you just can't, you can't really absorb. There's so much to take in and enjoy. Yeah. And especially when you start talking to people, because that's probably one of the best bits is just talking to different people and learning about different things. Again, you feel like you maybe can't do that so much if you're trying to get around, I don't know, 25 different rooms in a day. So if you can yeah. spread it out, it's going to be just more relaxed, isn't it? More enjoyable. Um, and you can have a few beers as well. That's the, probably the best bit. Yeah, I was about to say that. that, that <laughs> that's a good part. The other thing is, like, I, I found both with Bristol and with Ascot, we discovered all the best stuff as we were about to leave. <laughs> so it's like, you know, we discovered the cord room in Bristol, for example, right as as we were getting to uh, to the end of our, our visit there. And, you know, all of the all of the good rooms in Ascot, we sort of found towards the end of the day. And it's it's almost like shit, man, I wish I had another day to be able to spend proper time there. And obviously, in our case, play some of our music, and then that clearly quickly clears out the room <laughs> that we have it to ourselves. <laughs> I'm surprised they let you play that. Actually, it's probably because it's got classical written on the CD. But actually, when, when they is, press mate. play, <laughs> <laughs> classical classical audio file playlist, and then the rack, the record begins. But uh, you know, I think the one thing, unfortunately, with playing this kind of music as well, and I, and I don't mean to hate on uh, my fellow metal brethren, but let's be honest. <laughs> many of them don't have the sort of money to give away that you'd have to on this this so if you show up there with your slayer t-shirt and you're playing crazy music i don't think they expect you to be spending a lot of money um so i must confess i don't spend nearly as much as uh, as andre has done it's good to have him there because it opens the door to uh to being able to hear some very cool stuff but how how did I, mean, I don't think i've ever spoken to you about this how did you get into hi-fi as a hobby, you know, and what was your kind of starter system or your, your gateway into the abyss of wallet drainage that, uh, that comes with being, uh, being in the hi-fi game? Well, it's actually a long time ago. I was trying to remember exactly what happened. I actually think it started with home cinema. I remember my cousin got his first home cinema right when DVD first came out and he had a 5.1 system in his bedroom. And I remember sitting down and watching, I think it was a James Bond movie. It might've even been a matrix moving it's like oh wow this is this is moving on another level and then i couldn't have that i couldn't have a 5.1 so i think i bought an av receiver got two speakers put them up on the wall bought a, a, a rail q50 subwoofer which is not a very big powerful subwoofer but it's a physically very large subwoofer for a bedroom a small bedroom yeah. system and i think it started there and i remember having a system and i couldn't wait to get my first house so i could set speakers up properly set you know, set some stands up, set the speakers up, sit down and listen. And before I even achieved that, I managed to knock one of the speakers off of the stand and break it. So I never, ever got to hear that system set up in, you know, the audio yeah, glory yeah. that I was kind of aiming for. And then my eyes got too big for my belly. And I thought, well, right, I'm going to replace these speakers. If I'm going to replace them, I need to replace them with something worthy, if that makes sense. So I bought some used uh, Bowers and Wilkins 805s, the originals, the Nautilus 805s. And I was running them off of an AV receiver wondering why i couldn't get very good sound and mm. i fought that fire and fought that fire and then i bought different speakers and different speakers and different different speakers and all these different tweaks and tried you know ten thousand different things trying to uh, achieve something that i didn't really know what i was looking for i didn't really know but throughout this whole process it's just one big learning curve you just you're just kind of picking up different bits and pieces so i know some people might come into this as like music enthusiasts but you can also i think come into hi-fi just as a sound enthusiast, you're enthusiastic yeah. about sound quality. You're enthusiastic about trying to make sound uh, just more impressive. And to me, that's part of the driving force. It's, you know, how good can it get? How and how good can I get it is the other. That, that is what really used to drive me. It's kind of, mm -hmm. you know, what, what can I do to make it sound better? Because, you know, I've only got X amount of pounds. I've only got X amount of space. You look at all these beautiful systems and, you know, these amazing rooms. And that's very aspirational. But at the same time, it's like, well, I don't have that. I've only got this. And, I've, you know, yeah, what can yeah. I do to make this sound better and better and better? And that was kind of, a, I suppose, a massive driving force getting into, you know, building computer servers for it. I got, I got yeah, very deep into that for a few years. Um, so, yeah, I suppose that's where it's come from, just like a natural progression. Of, because there is so much information out there, you absorb it all. And, and then you want to try it all. Wow, I wonder what that's like. I want to try that. I wonder what that's like. Um, so I don't know how that relates to your kind of journey, Jackie. Whether it's so mine, mine is probably kind of a combination of both. So my dad had, uh, you know, one of the legendary uh, 3060, or actually I think it was a 3080 uh, NAD integrated amplifier, which, you know, when I was young and I had no frame of reference, I thought this is the greatest thing on the face of the earth. Uh, he had built himself, um, you know, two, you know, pretty good stereo speakers, 
um, you know, had a 15 inch um, base driver, you know, had, you know, two mid range drivers and a, and a ribbon, um, a ribbon tweeter uh, that he ran off of the, 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 the NAD, he would not allow me to use it. So I think probably a degree of sort of envy was born there that has since translated to how much I've been willing to spend on high fi as an, as, as an adult, because one of the best things to me was when I was young, and he would, you know, him and my mom would go off to the grocery store or whatever, um, you know, and this is, you know, we're talking like 10, 11, 12 years old, you know, then I would break out the CDs or break out the records or whatever. And I, I just sit listening, you know, studying the album cover, listening to the, um, you know, l- looking at the lyrics. Um, when we, when I moved here to the UK, um, obviously I didn't have anything like that. Um, my first sound purchase was a JBL soundbar, uh, you know, which I thought I was fucking Johnny Big Rocks. Having uh, having that, you know, amazing. I used to tell people, come in here, just listen to this. It's so incredible. Um, and then uh, Andre, uh, who I've, I've mentioned, um, you know, and I've mentioned on the show plenty of times, he had a, a pretty decent setup at the time. He had, a, I think, C, um, CM9s um, as his two front speakers. And then he had a 7.1 system where he had um, CM6s as the side and rear surrounds. Uh, and he was running that off a of Pioneer uh, AVR. So that that to me at the time sounded pretty pretty impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought, okay, I want to get myself something, uh, you know, something like this too. But obviously, I didn't have that amount of money. That's the exact same experience, Jackie. If, you, if you've you've hit that, I, I had the exact same experience. Yeah. What, funnily enough, what I forgot is as a kid, I, my first stereo system what must have been maybe seven or eight was what they call like a I think a boombox or something. You know, like a yeah, tape yeah, player yeah. boombox. And then from there, I had a. A company called Iowa or Awa, A I I remember Iowa as well. <laughs> a five C D disc change changer system that had a bass boost button and all these flashing LEDs. So so like in terms of having sound and yeah, you know, better sound and stuff, I had that as a kid. I used to listen to the same music constantly. And as you was talking, I was thinking, my son now is eight. He now just pulls up his iPad, goes on YouTube, and he'll listen to the same song over and over and over again for a pair of headphones that I gave him. So he's actually got some uh, Sennheiser 6XX, the uh, drop ones that I got and gave to him. So he's kind of got a pretty good hi-fi system as an eight-year-old, but, mm. you know, coming off of an iPad, it's a pretty good source. But he just, yeah. he won't appreciate that to him. That's just... That's that, just that, how, that, that's how it's done. Yeah, but that's the start of his journey, isn't it? I'm hoping yeah. anyway. Well, you know, maybe it will, maybe it won't be, but it's it does start at a younger age. I mean, I'd forgot about all that, so I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Well, th- funny you mentioned that that uh, five CD I woke because Andre had one as well, and I used to fucking love that thing. I I had a piece of shit like I think it was a KIC or Kenwood or some piece of nonsense. You could kind of disconnect the speakers, but that's about it. And I remember like putting you know placing the speakers like oh that sounds way better now, and fooling myself into thinking that again that I was I was listening to something quite cool. But I remember Andre's system being awesome, and that it had that bass boost button as well, which is why I'm thinking I wouldn't be surprised if it's if it's the same thing. But anyway, yeah. So I I kind of then graduated from the JBL soundbar to uh, a, um, a Q Acoustics uh, that's seven thousand series uh, surround sound of theirs, like the five point one setup where it's like those little satellite speakers of theirs, which is actually pretty good for the for the money. And I ran it through a Denon um, twenty three hundred AVR. Uh, like that. And then one day Andre said, he'd kind of moved up to CM10s by that point. He said, I'm going to sell my CM10s. I want you to have them and you can just pay me whenever you've got the money to, to pay me. So I got the CM10s. Um, and then I went on eBay and I bought an, Ar- an Arcam A85 integrated amp and an Arcam P90 integrated amp. And I buy amp those and I ran that into the, um, the CM10s. And from basically that was kind of the 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 floodgates open from there so we'll talk about my my actual virtual tour in a second but the uh you know the the system has graduated substantially from from where it was there well that's a pretty quick rise isn't it into into what i'd call like a proper system really yeah it's a pretty quick rise from soundbar to 7.1 or 5.1 whatever it was home cinema into then into yeah pretty good stereo system that's a pretty quick rise but that that is how quick it gets you that's why isn't it that's how Mm. quick the bug the bug hits home and you can hear well that's better than this and i suppose for you because you've got a friend who's investing in these things and and you're experiencing that that's fundamentally what i think it boils down to because i think it's very easy to just sit in a chair and think well this is this is amazing this is the best sound you can possibly ever hear but then you go and hear something else and you think oh actually no you know it can get a lot better and that, that, that's all part of the well, you can either bury your head in the sand and ignore it, or that's part of the learning curve, isn't it? You know, I want to get better. And, you know, how do, how do you understand what better is 
well, you need to hear it, don't you? You need to hear it for yourself. And that, that is literally all it takes because once you've heard it, you can never unhear it, which is the best and worst bit about this hobby because that's the bit that makes you spend all the money. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, one one product I know you and I both have in common in terms of how much we admire it, and I, you, I think you own one as well, is the um, the Cord um, M Scaler. Yeah, which I'm straight away. <laughs> I mean, when I as soon as I heard it, my mouth just just dropped. It was like, Jesus, that is incredible. I mean, make, it makes such a difference. I, I don't have one yet, but it, for sure, it's on the it's on the roadmap. Well, funnily enough, I I use that to test other DAX timing because I see how good their timing is by compared to the signal you can feed them with that, and that is how I, I kind of test how good the DAC is, if that makes sense. How how well because that the t- the timing music's about lots of different things but timing is really critical how organized and i think some people like maybe like a little bit more chaos but to me i feel like music should be organized and layered properly because if you think about how music's going to be built it's going to be built with layers singers back in yeah yeah, and, yeah and the more of that the clearer all that is being presented to you the better but i think you do have to watch it a little bit because obviously if a system becomes too what people refer to as analytical sounding then it it's, it can be less pleasurable so there's a real fine line between it sounding very clear and crisp, but still being a pleasurable experience that, that I think you enjoy that, you know, I, I call it giving you a musical cuddle, you know, it makes you feel happy. It makes mm. you feel good. Um, and that, that's a real fine line. And, and everybody's lines probably ever so slightly, ever so slightly different based on. Well, I, I, I think again, you, we spoke about this on your channel. I think it comes down to some of that, um, you know, what, what genre of music you tend to listen to most and and what's going to you know what speakers are going to work best with what you listen to what setup is going to work best with what you listen to because there there is for sure you know now that i'm far more experienced and i've had the opportunity to to listen to a lot of different uh brands and you know try a lot of different things there are for sure amplifier brands and speaker brands that just don't they would not work with black metal or death metal or some of the stuff i listen to you can hear where they're going to shine is with classical music, uh, you know, or with electronic music or whatever the case may be, whereas with my stuff, they won't. And actually, I would say that the brand I've been most loyal to, Bowers and Wilkins, um, you know, Bowers and Wilkins could very easily be too harsh on your ears when it comes to listening to the stuff that I listen to, especially once you graduate up to the Diamond series. So you need to be very, very careful with um, with component pairing there because you you kind of need to, you almost need to tame some of its tendencies to, to have a very bright uh, treble or, you know, have quite a, it can sometimes have quite a piercing mid-range. Um, but again, that's kind of part of the fun of it. And I, you know, I guess a question that's stemming from that is I wanted to talk to you about, you know, how you got into, I guess, deciding that you wanted to make this, uh, you know, a, a, turn this into a channel or turn this passion into a channel. But then also, I mean, I know you've now kind of turned this into a career, right? Oh, yeah, I decided to go uh, full time with this back in May last year when when lockdown started. That was going to have a massive impact on my day job. And I, I was already re- pretty much working two full time jobs anyway, a full time job plus doing this and making you know crazy amounts of videos. And it was just something I had to give somewhere. You know, obviously, I've got, uh, you know, we're not married, but I've got Mrs. Two, two kids. Something has to give somewhere. And I thought, well, let's just jump in and give this a go. And uh, yeah it's been going okay you know it can always go better but i'm still here um still got a roof over the head thank god and uh when I mean, you laugh but it's uh, it's, no, it's quite no. a big it's quite a big risk you know to well, jump dude, that's, into i mean that's that's yeah. a serious that's that's yeah. some serious courage that would have taken because it's not just uh you know i know i know what you were doing before and and you sort of had a, a book of clients built up which you you're almost kind of you know once you once that bridge is burnt uh, and they move on to to somebody else who can who can, who can help them. It it would be incredibly difficult building yeah. that back up again, um, you know, to sort of jump into this passion. But I mean, you, you know, you can tell from your channel, you know, how how much you love what you're doing, and what I what I have been extremely happy to see is how much your channel has grown. Uh, I mean, I think when I first started watching, I remember the the subscriber count was on about ten thousand, and I mean, I th- you're on thirty nine, nearly forty thousand subscribers now. Yeah, I mean, I was I was forty back in May, and I was hoping and praying I could do forty thousand by the time I was forty, because that would have been a, a wonderful promotional thing to say. It didn't happen, but I'm hoping it happens in the same year. So I'm still going to use it if that makes sense. You know, I was forty this year and uh, forty thousand subscribers. So you know, and what's interesting about that is that that's a lot of people. When you actually think about that, that's a lot of people. But because there's already channels that are much bigger, you, you're always kind of looking at the grasses, grass is greener situation and you're very critical of yourself, if that makes sense. You know, why, why have I not got 50? Why have I not got 100? You know, so it's one, it's one of those situations. And you, obviously you're going through it as well. It's the whole system. 
it feels like it fights you at times. It, it motivates you. I think it fights you to motivate you. And you always feel like I should, you know, if it's 40 this year, that should be celebrating. But really, I want 50. You know, that's, that's just how it goes. But in terms of getting into this, it, it, twofold, really. One was I saw a big hole because, you know, I used to do a lot of carp fishing. And there was lots of people making carp fishing videos. In fact, I learned to carp fish from watching videos, DVDs at the time, but still. And I went, I went looking for hi-fi content on YouTube and there was hardly any. There was a few, couple of channels doing a few bits, but nothing that I could massively relate to, if that makes sense. So I thought, well, there's a hole there. Someone needs to fill it. And if I don't, if I don't fill it today, someone else will fill it tomorrow. So that's yeah. kind of the motivation to, to make a start. Plus, I was sick and tired of arguing with people about certain things, about some things making a difference on forums. So I thought, well, I'm going to start recording the sound of this difference because if I can hear it and if I can record it, well, then it's real. And that mo motivated me as well to try and record differences in different bits and pieces because when you've argued and argued and argued with people, this <laughs> you're never going to get anywhere. And I don't know if even the video will get you anywhere. But you know, if, if I can record the sound and kind of prove it to myself, and, you know, and put it out there, well, then there's at least a little bit of justification in that. So it's a bit of an unusual, I suppose, motivation to get into it. But since then, it's now it's been a case of trying to become more established, trying to become more well known within within the industry side of things, if that makes sense. And more manufacturers know who you are, um, and yeah, want you to review their products. And that that's gradually and gradually and gradually got more. Um, how do I explain that? Um, gradually, I feel like that's that's become. I'm achieving that is probably the right way to put it. You know, yeah, becoming yeah, more yeah. well known and, and working with different manufacturers because that, that that's fun as well, isn't it? You're looking at different products, looking at different DAX, looking at different speakers, different speaker types. So it's it's back to well, one of those. You know, one of the things you've done really recently, which I think is excellent, is this um, um, uh, kind of mid-range bookshelf shootout. You know, where you you comparing twelve different speakers, and what I liked about the angle that you took because I I completely get that it would be. I think it'd be very, very challenging to have a manufacturer send you something and you give it a bad review. You, I guess you have to always be so careful with how you frame any sort of criticism or any sort of negative points because you don't want them to feel like you're just running the product down for the sake of running it down. Plus, I, I, I do think you get to a point in this game where you're very rarely going to hear a pair of bookshelves that are made by a reputable, a reputable manufacturer that are just total crap. So, but what I liked is I, I love the way that you you presented that whole piece because it's you know just just anybody who's gonna who's got fifteen hundred to spend on a pair of bookshelf speakers are probably gonna be looking at it you know at least some of the speakers on this list, and so here's what they might be good for here's what you need to think about when you when you uh, you know when you kind of weighing up your options here's how you've experienced them I thought that was awesome um, and I really do think I I, fa I feel like you've you've found your your niche. Uh, in this uh, in this scene because you know like Shane from Spare Change you know for sure has his niche um, you know which is inadvertent comedy and <laughs> very good <laughs> theater stuff I love him by the way I, yeah. I, I mean I find him such a such a fucking um, entertaining character to watch as well uh, but then there's, there's there's a lot of kind of grifters that are there as well but I like I said what I like about what you do is and um, you know this is not this is an unpaid PSA anybody watching this that wants to get into the hi-fi game if you want to actually understand what goes on under the guts of a product whether it's going to work for you etc et you're not going to find a more informative channel than Pursuit you. of Perfect System what, what was interesting when you first start looking at products and I was very lucky to work quite closely with a dealer which is where we met and I got my hands on all these really lovely products and at first you are blown away a little bit by the quality of them so you kind of find yourself being very excited about these products because it's kind of your first experience with some very nice you know very very nice hi-fi gear in your home or in, in your own system but as time's gone on and I've looked at lots of different products kind of the breadth of experience has changed and the way I look at things has changed a little bit as well so at first you're probably very excitable about these products wow these are amazing these are great for all these reasons and then over time you start to look at different qualities and different bits and pieces and you start to appreciate well this one's different to this one and this one's better than this one for this reason but maybe not quite as good and then you have to kind of rein it in and just realize as a reviewer you're there to give out information you're not there to sell the product for the manufacturer that that's a big difference and there are some youtube channels that are run by hi-fi dealers and therefore mm. they are there to sell the product for the manufacturer for themselves and i think quite a few people just put me in the same bracket as that so they, they thought i was a dealer for some reason probably because some of the videos i've made has been at a dealer's 
So I think they tarnished me with that same brush. Or this guy is, he, you know, he's selling these products that he reviews. And I only realized that funnily enough through speaking to Shane from Spare Change. He invited me on his channel because he thought I was a dealer and we got chatting. And he opened my eyes to that um, mis in, misinterpretation of me. If mis, that makes mis, sense. Misrepresentation. Yeah, yeah. So I'm kind of now fighting the fire back just to make people aware that I, I don't sell anything. It's not a single box. And, I, and I've met, therefore made a very, very conscious decision. It's about trying to get the information correct, mm. the information you put out correct, especially when it comes to praise and criticism. Because obviously it's one one pair of ears in one room set up one way, listening for one set of things. Mm. And th there's no real other way to do it for me personally. Even if you brought in five different people and you analyze five different things, th then the message you put out could be confusing, couldn't it? If you're putting out five, you know, so, and, and in a way the comparison aspect probably helps people to understand that, 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 that there is a difference and that the difference exists. But what, what we're seeing now quite a lot is uh hype you know products being very much praised and hyped all at once and that probably leads to people just buying those products because it is the hype product and this is not just new this has been happening in you know what high fire magazine for decades five stars products of the year so certain products do get promoted and hyped and there's nothing wrong with buying those products nothing at all they're obviously very good but is it just because it's great for this reason is it going to be great for you and yeah. is it the kind of sound yeah. that you're looking for? Yeah. And yeah. The, the more stuff you listen to, you start to realize, oh, actually, you know, this might suit somebody for this reason. And this might suit somebody for this reason. Or this product's going to really challenge you as an audiophile. It's going to ask more of you. Set up system. And that, that's what really stood out to me about the group test recently. Like, for example, the Kef LS50 Metas. Loads of people would have bought those speakers because they are the latest and greatest LS50 Met like, speaker off the back of the first one and that's a brilliant speaker i had some fantastic sound out of them but it, they was asking more of me i was like oh wow i need to i need to be putting this component front in front of them i would need to do this with them whereas some of those other speakers in that group test you just put them on and they just play music and they was much less fussy mm. so depending on where you are with how you feel and how anal you're going to be with the system and the setup well one of those speakers is going to suit you better than the other and that is what I was trying to get across. And that is why it was very difficult to pick an outright winner in that group test because none, none of them stood out in every single area to say, right, buy me, don't buy none of the others. It really mm -hmm. wasn't that easy. Um, whereas the group test I did before, I, I could quite happily say, if you buy the Wharfdale Evo 4.2, that's going to tick enough boxes for enough people for its price to, to, to you know, to make 95% of people happy. You know, that, that was the difference between those two. And that, yeah, interesting. Very, very interesting. Yeah. By the way, I think uh, that I, th I think when I did it last time, when I did this uh, i five uh, special last time around, I actually spoke about the Wolf Wolf Del Evo um, speakers. We were, um, I think this was at Bristol. We were at, in in the room where they did uh, a Wharfdale. Uh, I can't remember whether they were there. They were the Linton speakers, but they did a Wharfdale and Audio Lab pairing and and presented that. I mean, that system couldn't have cost more than about two thousand pounds. But even Andre, who's I'm, I'm not quite as harsh on cheaper systems as what he can be. Um, but even he was like, "Fuck, that sounds really good, really, really good." Like we were, we were both super surprised. I mean, I think as far as value for money, that's that's fantastic. I would also just as a comment, and this is probably a nice segue into doing the High Fire Act tour. I have a pair of uh, Kef uh, LSX speakers in my bedroom, uh, just because I, you know, we we watch TV in the bedroom, but I don't want to listen to TV sound, and also. What I've found is I, I love just lying in bed, streaming music to, the, to those speakers. They are such fantastic value. And actually, as a starter system, I would almost suggest if you, if you only have a thousand pounds to spend and you want to have a starter system, buy yourself a pair of LSX, uh, LSX uh, Kev speakers. They're, they're superb. Well, this, can... is where, this, this is where, you, again, you need to be, just be mindful of the advice. Those are really nice speakers, beautifully built, beautifully engineered. I got invited, funnily enough, to the launch of those, the UK launch. I got to hear them, got to speak to uh, one of the main designers, Jack Hopley Brown, about all that. That was really interesting. But if you put them in a big room, they're not going to yeah, give true. you the same experience as in true. a smaller room. So yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's just one of those. And that, that is what they're designed for. So they've designed the LSX to be a smaller speaker in a smaller room. And then you, the, the whole idea is if you've got a larger room or you just want to play, listen, if you want to listen to music louder, sorry, you buy the, the larger ones, you buy the LS50 wireless. So yeah. that's that's really Kef's in, intention. So just yeah, just in terms of giving out right information, the LSX is fantastic, but if you put them in a larger room, they're going to sound like small speakers in a large room. That's just, it's, it's physics, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, it's yeah, the yeah. physics of that. 
by the way, it was your, it was your, uh, it was that video of yours that made me buy the LSX <laughs> speakers. So let, let Kef know and tell me they owe you a freebie because I, I was, I was looking for something for the room. Um, and then I watched that video and I was like, actually, let me, let me give this. And I knew I could always give them back if I didn't yeah. like them, but I was, I, I, I keep saying to, you know, to, to uh, my girlfriend and to anybody I talk to, it's like, of, of, everything that I've bought, these might be the ones that sometimes I kind of feel happiest with because I, because they're just so perfect for what I, what I use them for. But anyway, that's just a, just quickly on that. If you can see over there, hopefully it's on camera that, that those are two Kef Muo speakers. I always get confused between the Muo and the Muon. One of them's the big massive silver things. And those yeah, are yeah. like the little portable Bluetooth speakers. And one of my first videos was about them in its, in the sense of, um, I actually call them the best speakers because you can take them anywhere with you. You can take them on holiday. I mean, I use them to clean the car so that I've got some, you know, good sounding, pretty banging tunes while I'm out cleaning mm. the car for, for hours. But that, that is exactly the, exactly the same really as the LSX, just, just smaller again, if that makes sense, and obviously battery powered. So it's the, the whole pr the premise of that was getting really good sound anywhere. That, that was what made them so special, which is exactly mm. what the LSX is for, is you know, being able to get very, very high quality sound from very compact products into smaller spaces. Um, so yeah, sorry, yeah, just, yeah, I thought I've mentioned no, Well, that's, I, I've, I've actually not seen those before, so uh, oh, wow. they're, they're, they're very good. I am very tempted to buy myself a set of uh, LS50 um, twos, the wireless twos uh, to replace these LSXs, um, just because I, as I said, I've started to get into the habit of lying in bed listening to music now, and I was thinking to myself the other day, maybe it would be, and this is the way it always goes with anything hi-fi, maybe it would make me happier if <laughs> something a little bigger. Um, so let's let's talk about my, my hi-fi rack. So since the last update, I have finally graduated from the 803 D3s to the speaker that I have always wanted ever since I first heard it, the 800 D3s. Um, once again, this was, uh, thanks in large part to Andre who upgraded and sold me his pair. Um, but from the second that they, that they wheeled those into this house, I, I've just absolutely adored them. And they, they are such a massive step up from the 803s. Like you wouldn't think it because they, I mean, in, in terms of size, they are much bigger. Um, you know, obviously in terms of price, there's a difference as well, but in, in terms of sound, sound stage, imaging, everything is it's vastly improved. I mean, it, it, I, I, and I, and I, I know this has been echoed by a lot of people I've spoken to, uh, you know, including for mutual friends of ours. Um, I'm not sure for the full, I mean, I know they're very expensive, but I'm not sure for that price, you're going to get anything better. Uh, they, they are phenomenal speakers. I obviously I use them in terms of use for me, it's 50, 50 um, home cinema and music, but they work phenomenally well for both. Yeah, what, what's interesting there is you've gone through the kind of through the range a little bit because normally for me it's like i really want the top of the range speaker in the range that you're looking at i really want it but you either can't have it because it's too big or it's too expensive and you end up getting one that's kind of in the middle of the range which is mm. i think why ranges exist isn't it really to cater yeah, yeah. for the different budgets and different size rooms but there's always something in the flagship one obviously i spent a lot of time with kef reference freeze that i owned up until recently and whenever i heard the reference fives it's like, oh, I can just hear where the five is just, you know, just that bit better than the three in, in certain areas. So it's, it's not always about, it's not always about that because you can get really great sound out of everything. But it's like get, getting the flagship, especially, especially for Bowers, because the 800 is the flagship speaker, isn't it? For a whole, mm. a whole subset of audio files, that is their dream speaker. So it doesn't matter how you get it, whether it's by hook or crook, the fact you've got it, you must be. Yeah, really happy. Um, very, very chuffed, mate. <laughs> and then I, the other thing that I'm, I'm, I'm falling in love with increasingly. So I, I still have my ATI uh, amplifier, and I did run them. Uh, technically speaking, what I own is the ATI six hundred and two amplifier, which I think is a very good amplifier. It's not, you know, it's not Griffin level. The Griffin Diablo three hundred has always been kind of the amplifier that I've wanted for these speakers, even though it, in terms of power, it's probably a little bit light for the for the eight hundred D threes. However, uh, I have the uh, Rotel Mishi S five on loan, and the longer that I have had that, because I've had it here for about two months now, the, the, the longer that I've had it, the more I'm starting to fall in love with it. To a point where I think there's like one of two options now. I'm, I might either call up the the dealer and say how much to just buy the demo s5 off of you um because i think it's phenomenal or let me try the the m8 monoblocks 
because I, sus- I suspect that the M8 monoblocks are going to sound even better. The only question that I have with that is right now, in terms of like wall space, I basically have, I've, I've got one of two possible outcomes. Either I'm going to get the M8 monoblocks and then resign myself to never having a subwoofer because I won't have space for it. Or I get myself the, um, I buy the S5, <clears throat> excuse me. And then I, what I, the, the, the sub that I'm interested in buying is the REL uh, 212 SX. Because and and this is maybe this is another thing I want to talk about in a second. I stacked my uh, my my Rel uh, S eight twelves when I had a uh, when I had a pair of those, and what I found was that the kind of increasing the height where the bass frequency is coming from just was mind blowing to me. And I only had two of them. I had them in the corner of the room, so I didn't have the the kind of stack of four that some folks have. I know that you've you've experimented with, but just having that bass coming from higher up was just a just I couldn't believe it. I, I, again, I was saying to Paige, like just listening to this, you know, the soundtrack of this movie, I'm just, my jaw is just open it as to how much of a difference it makes. But anyway, back to the amplifier question. That's kind of for me, the, 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 you know, what I'm wondering right now, do I go with the M8s? Do I go, you know, in which case no sub? Um, I think they will push enough bass out of the, the, the Bowers and Wilkins speakers anyway. And those speakers have, you know, can go to very low frequencies. And if you're putting a thousand Watts through them, there's no way you can struggle, but yeah, I'm wondering about that. The Griffin but, is still, a, still an option, but I just think, I just think Mishi has done or Rotel has done such a fantastic job with these, these amplifiers. I, I, again, in terms of value for money, what they've achieved is extraordinary. I think. Well, what's interesting there is you've got, uh, and again, this is speaking very general. So you've, you've got quite a few different quandaries there. For starters, the quandary between a stereo power amplifier and, and monoblocks. And I must say, whenever I've heard monoblocks and I've heard very, very small ones that you know punch above their weight and I've heard big ones, whenever I've heard monoblocks compared to stereo power amplifiers, there's just something about the sound that is a bit cleaner. And I, and I don't know why that is. It's just something that you notice. And it, it's difficult to associate just that with just stereo power amplifiers and monoblocks. But whenever I've heard a hi-fi system that's running monoblocks, it's always just that little bit cleaner for some reason. But actually, I was watching your your last um, system tour before it came on, and that that ATI power amplifier, the one thing that separates that from 99.9% of others is the dual power inputs. So technically, they are that is really two monoblocks in in one chassis. And that I've just been looking at an outstandingly good stereo power amplifier that is dual mono, but it's still only one power in, if that makes sense. So t- technically it's not dual mono. The only dual mono is that ATI, which is you know, it's to- totally separated units, really, just in the same, just attached, isn't it, in the same in the same chassis. Um, which also makes so, it a nightmare to carry, but... <laughs> oh, it's going to be heavy. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the amplifier I've just been looking at is 40 kilograms. They're heavy. These are heavy, heavy things. And there is, funny enough, I've just put the review out for it. There is there is something to be said for higher power amplifiers. There mm-hmm. is just something about it. And the, the two things that I spoke about in that review was, the first one was headroom. So I, I like to listen quite loud, but it, it's not even necessarily about the perceived volume because I think to get a lot more volume, you need a lot more power. That's just how human works and physics works. But it, it's the way the power can be delivered with a big powerful amplifier. So for example, with this is an electric companion power amplifier that I'm talking about. It seemed to just deliver more power into the base aspect of things. And the speakers that I was using, they are very modest size, but they've got a passive subwoofer built inside, really quite a clever design. And off of another very good amplifier, that passive subwoofer was doing something but not that much off of the big electric companion power amplifier. All of a sudden that subwoofer sounded like a subwoofer. So much bigger, more substantial, more rounded, more full bass. And, and because that bit of the soundstage is filled in more, you start to get more soundstage, more, you know, it's amazing how, what, how that if the effect of more bass is, but it, ma- it makes the room feel bigger. It makes the whole sound feel yeah. bigger. Yeah, and, yeah. It, and it seems to affect things differently to what to what you might expect. So having a lot more power in that stereo power amplifier, for example, with those exact same speakers, they sounded like much larger speakers, much more accomplished and much more expensive speakers. So it matters. Yeah, power matters. But interestingly, when you go the other the other way of things, you can use you know two watt amplifiers into really efficient speakers and then you can get a similar type effect. So it's. <laughs> It's, it's so difficult, isn't it, to, to pick mm-hmm. one or the other? But I, obviously, if you're going with Bauer speakers, then you, you you want power with them. That's I think that's that's a given. Um, but wh- whether you can get away with not using a subwoofer or not, that that's a really really interesting one because 
subwoofers definitely can add something extra. Yeah, no, and, it, and it can allow an extra level of resolution, and it can allow an extra level of complexity, which is the negative side of it. But if you overcome the complexity with a really careful setup, then you can unlock another level of performance, even with really good speakers. But I feel like the better the speaker, the more it requires to achieve that. So it's <laughs> it's all the puzzle. It's all the challenge. It's all the puzzle of trying. But that's 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 trying to make it fun. work. Yeah, trying to make it. Work. I. I I obviously on the topic of subwoofers. So when I did the last update, I had the SVS SB4000. The uh, power module in that subwoofer blew. And then annoyingly, they sent me a replacement. Well, actually, they didn't even send me a replacement. They sent me back to the dealer and I had to then manually fix it myself, which which I thought was a bit annoying if you're paying, you know, 1600 or 1800 for a for a sub. Um, sorry, just bear with me one second. I hear the dog knocking on the door. Okay. So let me just let her in. Anyway, so what I what I did as a um, to replace those, I bought uh, two Rel uh, 812 subs. I then subsequently sold those to kind of get the cash together to pay the the difference on the 800s because I sold the 803s. So selling the 803s and the Rels gave me enough money to buy the 800s. <clears throat> so, like I said, so the next the the this, the the next sub I'm seriously considering is the is the Rel. Uh, uh, two on two SX, because in the in the brief period that I had uh, the eight hundreds and those rails, I actually had the uh, the the rails stacked in the corner of the room because that's really the only place that I had space for them where it made sense to keep them, and that that height, like I said, was it was mind boggling. It was just incredible how how much of a difference it made. So I, I'm I feel like that the the two on two is going to make a difference too, and I'm I am definitely. I know you're a fan of their stuff too. I'm a, a rel convert through and through. Um, whether it's their small subs, their larger subs, I've when they are set up properly, they sound phenomenal. Well, it's interesting because I, I had a lot of the original rails, which were the Qs. Like I mentioned, I started with a Q50. Then I yeah. think I got a Q100. Then I think I got a Q150. So I started off with a big subwoofer. And then the more money you pay and the more power, the smaller the subwoofer got, which is a really weird sort of thing. And... Uh, partly it was because of lack of experience and lack of knowing what I was doing, but I struggled, really, really struggled to get what other classes integrated base with those subwoofers. Couldn't, could yeah. never really get it. So you could get okay results, but then more recently getting to some experience with the latest rails, like the eight twelves that you had, they're really fantastic. And even the T, the T range from before, so not the current TXs, the TIs, I do a lot of calibrations for people that have those subwoofers. And I, funny enough, I did one a couple of weeks ago where the guy had two T7Is and I was able to integrate them. And because of his room, because of where he sat, he was getting deep bass out of these very small subwoofers down to about 30 hertz. So for some people, that wouldn't be deep bass. But for the majority of audio files, 30 hertz is deep bass. And a lot of the time you'll see bass figures and they're giving you minus 6 dB or minus 3 dB figures for these deep. That's not audible. For deep for bass to be audible, if you look at how human hearing is, you actually need quite high SPLs at deeper bass frequencies for, for it to be perceived as audible. So th this is why subwoofers are important because it's hard to get those SPLs out of out of speakers because of designs, etc. And, and I think speakers are probably designed with 40 upwards in mind. So let's get 40 upwards really good rather than let's focus on 40 down, which which actually makes more sense because by 40 I mean 40 hertz for example, because the majority of what you're, you're going to hear is going to be from 40 to, I don't know, maybe 10,000, 20,000, depending on how good your hearing is. So really the bit below that, 40 and below, you can actually think it's not as important, but it's surprising when you fill that bit in, it, it does make a noticeable difference to a lot of things. So I suppose it's just all about tick boxes, isn't it, really? So if I, if I can get bass from 40 upwards, great, then maybe I can live without 40 below. Yeah, or, yeah, or maybe I can add that at a later date. And he, you don't necessarily, you might not necessarily need whacking great big subwoofers to do that if you're careful with them and if you place them correctly. So, if, you know, if you are space limited, there are ways around it as well. But again, it all, it's all dependent on room on room size um, and then set up. And this is where DSP comes massively, becomes massively important, I think, because trying to get 
an integration between a speaker and a subwoofer is so difficult because the way the speakers are behaving in the room is always totally different to the subwoofer. And you're trying to get, obviously if, on the podcast, you won't see this, but if you're trying to get like an equal blend, yeah, so the speaker, subwoofer, if that's trying to be some kind of equal blend, well, then the more even or more similar they are in frequency response, the easier that's going to be. If they're, if they're all over the place, trying to match that up, yeah, it's going to be really, really difficult. So that's, that's always something to bear in mind. With, yeah, with, with which, is, which is the benefit of having something like uh, what Andre has now with the Trident, where you've got the subwoofer and the speaker essentially built you know, built in one, uh, you know, as, as, as one speaker. And so they always remain in phase. And so you have that perfect roll off and you can hear the difference between perfect roll off, perfect integration, as you said, and, you know, someone who's a little bit off, you know, where I, I really saw that, um, or that was very eye opening to me, uh, again, our mutual friend, Roger, we were at his house for a barbecue a little while back and he's got, I think he's got a T7 and a T9. He's got a T, the T7 in the left-hand corner of the room and the T9, in the rear right hand corner of the room and i was fucking blown away by it. I, I actually asked him did terry do this for you and he's like no 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 i, I did it myself and i was like jesus christ that sounds good you know, like for, for for you know two relatively small inexpensive subwoofers like that that level of bass performance i was stunned i thought it was uh, outstanding was that for mu- music or was that a movie we were playing games Oh well, okay. Um, so I had okay. uh, I had Titanfall two on. Uh, I just literally I just wanted to hear the the system. Yeah. Um, but I was very impressed, very very impressed. Um, so anyway, okay. So moving on. So so like I said, I, I think I think the S five the S five or the M eight I'm going to end up getting. So it's going to be one of those two. But um, you know, and then we'll see what we do with the with the ATI. I think if I if I keep the ATI the ATI or if I if I take the M eight, I might keep the ATI and use that as a center speaker amplifier because right now i use a class a sigma monoblock uh to drive my center speaker which is 350 watts of class d power and good god does it make a difference i think it was it was also roger that got us onto the idea of of using a monoblock for uh for a center speaker and we tried it at andre's house and we were like fuck that sounds different like you you know i think a lot of people don't realize when they're watching movies uh, or when they're messing around with these systems for the first time, just how important your center speaker actually is. Uh, and I've now since sold my HTM2 center speaker. I've got an HTM1, which is much bigger, you know, requires far more power. But the amount of information that that is able to retrieve, um, you know, and the amount of impact it's able to create running that through its own dedicated amplifier is huge. Well, I, I did a calibration back in the last year, I think it was, for a guy with a, a a be- an amazing room, absolutely amazing, huge, great big room. And he had Bowers and Wilkins 800s and he had a whole Arkham stack and he had three power amplifiers. One was multi-channel and there was two uh, two stereo power amplifiers. And one of them was doing stereo. One of them was bridge mono. Oh, no, tell a lie. Sorry, let me explain that again. So he had two stereo power amplifiers, two stereo that he was running bridge mono to the left and the right speakers. And then he was running the surround speakers and the center speaker off of the multi-channel power amplifier and as i was trying to this is a big room right when you're, you're pushing this system hard to achieve massive great big scale in this and i'm in a big big room and i was listening to it and i was struggling to get the vocal clarity uh, of the center speaker to match with the left and the right and it was actually the customer's idea he said well, why don't we try and change the orientation of these amplifiers so what we did we had the left and the right coming off of one stereo power amplifier then we used one of the other ones bridge mono into the center speaker and that unlocked the center speaker if that makes sense that brought so much more clarity out of that center speaker wow that that brought that all out but then what mm-hmm. happened as a, as a down of that was we were starting to get a bit less spice and clarity out of the left and the right so for for speakers like that your 800s the, the kind of the margin error is uh, margin for error is very very small back to what i said about the kef ls50 metas where you're, you're scaling that demand up exponentially when you're stepping into you know a flagship big you know big boy pants Mm. speaker there so this is one of those things where i think chasing the glory there's a lot that comes with that and it's you know people just say people just say spend all your money on the speakers spend all your money on the speakers i think in the modern world that's a mistake because speakers have got very very good and they show you just how good or maybe not so good the rest of the system is. So it's mm. it's not that easy anymore. It's you know chucking all the money at the speaker and hoping for glory. It's just it's not going to do it because the better the speaker, the more transparent it is, the more it shows you how good or not good the hi-fi system is. And this has been like this for for years. Like I said, when I first bought my first pair of Bowers Mulkey's 800, 805, sorry, 
they was just showing me how bad everything was I was feeding into them. And I could never get a satisfying sound out of them because I didn't know what I was doing wrong. So it's, so back, back to what you said about the center speaker, that is really important. However, we're talking about big systems here, big money systems. That's not relative to everybody. Mm -hmm. So what you can do with a more realistic world system, say for example, you've got an AVR, obviously I'm calibrating these all the time. Quite often the way the sound comes out of those, the center speaker can be quite a bit recessed and can be quite a bit held back. So I suggest to people, and this is what I do as part of calibrations, is you have to manage the sound that you're getting. So you can turn the volume up on the center speaker, or maybe you can adjust the distance a little bit to try and get the center speaker to come forward more in the sound stage. I'm giving away some big tips here for calibrations, by the way, I don't normally do this. So it's a case of, you know, the old fashioned days of 75, every, every speaker's gotta be 75 decibels. Well, in an ideal world, that might work, but none of us listen in that. We all listen in real, you know, real world situations. So to get more out of the center speaker, sometimes make it a bit louder or sometimes just adjust the distance a little bit, which is really a time distance. And therefore, you know, if you haven't got the money to be buying whacking great big power amplifiers, it's not the end of the world. You can still achieve the same kind of result from more real world electronics. So that's my top tip of the day, Jackie. I'm not giving out any more. So that's, <laughs> that's your lot. Cool. Um, well, I was going to say as well, just, just with regards to the, the mono block to a center speaker thing, Andre has an M8 running his center speaker right now. And that's, that's insane i think the next step from there is maybe getting a if i i don't really think i have the space here but even i think even getting a t7 and connecting that to the the center speaker um you know using that uh that wireless um uh, package that uh, that rel does i was i was thinking of experimenting with that as well at some point um, well, well funny enough i've been speaking to Rel about going to see um, they're, they're setting up a demo room and going to see their, I think they call it 3D sound, which is where they use subwoofers on lots of the speakers. Mm. And, uh, this is a really, really interesting one because they, I think the Dolby spec from years ago was every speaker full range. But in more recent years, the THX spec is all the speakers to 80 hertz and crossing over to subwoofers. And the, and the reason that is because 80 hertz and below bass is omnidirectional. So, 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 so it's a real interesting one here. What, what, what route do you go? Do you go high level subwoofers to all the speakers and set them all as large? What that does is then, in a way, makes a makes a setup a little bit a little bit easier because you're then not trying to integrate maybe one or two subwoofers with seven or eleven speakers. Technically, you, you're adding more subwoofers, so like, kind of like the, the importance of that crossover becomes a little bit easier. Yeah. But at the same time, you're not because you've still got the same problems of you know, getting the speaker and subwoofer perfectly matched. So it's <laughs> lots of different ways to skin a cap. Uh, one thing that you do get as a benefit with a line level subwoofer setup is that you have a time delay, which is normally set in distance. It might be milliseconds or it might be, you know, meters or centimeters or whatever. And that does give you an extra level of setup control to, to try and adjust to get things nice and tight, which you, you don't get with high level subwoofers. So that's one benefit of going that route, but you know, <laughs> that's a really interesting one there, Jackie. That's that's. I, a, I'm listening. Let me just get topic. this this hound away because uh, I need to talk to you about this actually as well. Uh, there's a, uh, I've got a meat delivery coming. <laughs> oh well, wow. so, but when, when, the, the way she is, whenever there's any sort of stranger at the front, then it's you know stranger danger. <laughs> actually, on the on the meat thing. So once I've decided on the amps, you you're gonna need to come over at some point yeah, and help me with yeah. my setup, but. I'll make it worth your while because it's, it'll be a bit of a journey. Um, I've tried this. Uh, it, it's basically, there's a place called Turner and George uh, in London that you can buy meat from. They run by Richard Turner, who owns Hawksmoor. One of the, 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 the kind of breeds of beef I've bought is a, uh, they call it a Gallican cow. Oh, it's wow. basically a dairy cow that when they get to about 12 years old, they slaughter them. It's the most expensive steak I've ever bought, but fucking hell, it's delicious because what? obviously dairy cows aren't particularly active. So they can, it's free. They, you know, these yeah. are free roaming cows, but they, they've lived a life. The meat has developed a natural flavor, also a natural marbling. It, it's got kind of this buttery texture. Oh my God. Best thing I've ever eaten. I've just started getting into steak shaking because of you, man. So I need, to, uh, I need to learn about all this, actually. Yeah. Well, like I said, when you uh, when you come, mate, I'll, uh, I'll 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 make one of those. I'll <laughs> fucking blow your hair back. <laughs> so, um, so okay. So if we move on, so I've got the Class A Sigma amp uh, running the the center speaker. The center speaker has now been upgraded. It's an HTM one D three. Then I have um, 
as my uh, my AV processor, I've got a, an a Arkham AV40, soon to be replaced with an Anthem uh, AVM70. Um, Why again that route accuracy? I I want to hear what the AVM70 sounds like. I know a lot of people rave about it. Um, there's I. I, I, I like the AV40 very much. I think the sound is very, very good. There are a lot of technical quirks with the Arkham that I just find maddening, um, you know, and I, and I find it maddening enough to where I'm, I'm open to trying something else. If, if it doesn't, if the, if the Anthem doesn't sound good, I'll just get an AV40 again. Um, yeah, and I will say... Until I've set that up for you, you haven't heard what the AV40 can do. That's, that is honestly one of those situations that yeah. until you've unlocked the full potential of the system, Dirac and full calibration no one's heard what those things can do and that sounds very promotional for me but i'm, I'm doing it all the time i'm in people's houses <laughs> yeah, yeah, all yeah. the time unlocking and people are like i can't believe the difference of just getting everything integrated together so well so well mate, like let I me said, say that before you get rid of that man. We'll, we'll, case, we'll, yeah. we'll we'll do that for sure i, I what i will say about the the, the arcam is uh, you know I'm, I'm very impressed with it and i'm even impressed with its uh ability to operate as a as a DAC when you're playing music through order of honor um last night i had a an hour listening session and i was too lazy to uh to go and change the um back input of the amplifier uh to move to my DAC, um my my main kind of music DAC. so i just had it on on the uh on the on the processor and i was like this actually sounds really good i wouldn't if, if i didn't have the external DAC, i wouldn't mind having this as kind of my main DAC. Mm. um that actually brings me to my next one I, I don't have a um, I don't have a preamp anymore because I sold the the P5 uh, to cover the cost of my new deck, which was a, a Cord Yugo TT2. I finally made the step up to that, and I I'd had a, T, a, a Yugo TT before that. The TT2, my God, it is so good, so 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 good. Yeah, I actually um, think that's a real sweet spot in the range. I, I actually prefer it to a, a lot of the other, uh, well, all the other Cord decks. To me, that is the sweet spot. One. I know some people would argue with me and disagree with me there that the Dave's much more transparent and there are benefits to the day for sure. But the TT2 is just, it just sounds very nice. It's got a nice factor about it. Back to what I said about being very clear. And it's wonderful having all this clarity, but sometimes music's just got to be pleasing to listen to. And I think that's where the TT2 is really nice because it's it's like that kind of line, but line, line down the middle, right, right, right where you want it. Clarity resolution but still musical and, and saturated you know tonally saturated yeah i feel i feel it's very it's it's very kind to music you know you sometimes get yeah. decks that like you've said before can be too analytical you know they can be they can be very harsh to bad recordings as well and i think with the music i listen to there's always the danger i mean a lot let's be honest a lot of the stuff that i listen to sounds like it was recorded by a fucking child <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was you know if you if you if you think about it in in, in kind of audio file terms it, it's it's not they're not good recordings so you need stuff that kind of forgives that a little bit griffin is uh, interestingly enough as high end as griffin is i find griffin to be some of the kindest components when it comes to music like you can play the biggest pile of shit recording through a, a, a Diablo or through an Antillian or even through a Mephisto and it'll still come out sounding good. Um, you know, and, and that that is with the Calliope deck or just deck deck um, or with, you know, running it through something else. It'll just, there's just something about the way, like I, I, I joked once I said to Andre, I, I bet you the Griffin guys are, are all into metal because they just seem to have created something that's perfect for the kind of music we listen to. What's interesting when you, when you look at their their flagship speaker, uh, which I've, I've been fortunate enough to see at a show and got a private demo, but I, I was so blown away by the fact that I was having this private demo that I was videoing that I forgot to pay attention to so many things. But afterwards, when you're looking at the video, it's like, well, those speakers, the Kodos, they're huge, great big things that are about eight foot tall. All these bass drivers, all these mid-range drivers, there's only one tweeter, just one tweeter. So if you, it's quite a big tweeter, but if you think, well, you know, one tweeter compared to all of these mid-range drivers, that's mm. going to give you a warmer sound, isn't it? That's just, look, physics, isn't it, really, when you think about that? So it's a case of, I suppose, then prioritising tonality and, and, and saturation. And I suppose they're also thinking larger rooms. Larger rooms might be a little bit more reflective and stuff. So it's about kind of, I suppose, balance. balance. Sound yeah. is all about balance, isn't it, really? Well, to me, it is, anyway. It's all about balance. Yeah, I've not I've not heard the Kodos yet. I've just heard the... Uh, I've heard the... Um the trident 2 which i was i mean literally just jaw on the floor it's yeah, it's, it's, this, it's absolutely incredible jackie man this is all next level stuff people watching this if you show some pictures it's it's it's, <laughs> it's, 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 that, it's no. at the point of extreme insanity really yeah, but yeah, yeah. 
But to me, is if so, if someone's choosing to buy these speakers, they could choose to buy anything else with that money. They could put that money into anything else. And the fact they choose to buy a hi-fi with it, I think that's absolutely awesome. Because I was about to say, mate, you could <laughs> you could quite comfortably put a deposit down on a house for yeah, the yeah. amount that you're going to spend on that. And look, I, I I'm not fooling myself into thinking I'm I'm fortunate enough to where I I've been able to enjoy them because you know I know somebody who has them. I, I, I myself. I, I, well, I, I myself will never ever own them. I yeah. think that I think the only step up I could conceivably see myself making without my girlfriend leaving me and saying you are fiscally irresponsible and I don't want you in my life anymore, maybe the Pantheons, um, which is kind of the, the speaker that's oh, okay. just a step down from the um, the the Tridents, and they are incredible as well. Well, I think with the way the, world, the modern world is, and this is not going to be the case for everybody, but I, I remember discussing somebody discussing this with somebody recently in the sense that, you know, people throughout their lives, they may have X amount of pounds to spend because they, you know, because of work and family and kids. But at some point in their life, they may get an inheritance, for example, maybe grandparents or parents or relative, and they may have a big chunk of money to spend then. And at that point, maybe they can then buy some lavish high, uh, hi-fi system that they've always dreamed about, always loved, and at one point in their life, they might have that opportunity. So it's, and I think I was discussing it with somebody about, you know, sometimes I've walked into hi-fi shops before, dealers, and, and you feel, this has not been recent years, but I mean, when I was a younger man, you, you feel like that, that you're not taken seriously and, and you feel like you are not um, treated with, I don't necessarily level of respect, but there's just a, a feeling, back to what you said about going to a hi-fi show, probably with a metal t-shirt on. It's just, it's just a certain factor of that. And it might be in your own head. Maybe you walk in there thinking, I'm not worthy of being in here because everything's so expensive. But, uh, uh, you know, at some point in somebody's life, they may have the chance to buy some of this really lovely stuff. But what, what I think you need to remember, Jackie, is what you own is already really lovely, mate, those speakers that you've got. And oh, say yeah. that's, that's massive, that's aspirational. No, I mean, I, I, I often, I look, at the, I look at my system and I'll be like, you know, think of the percentage of people that are into hi-fi that have the system that you have. And it's like, there's not a lot. So now I know I'm extremely fortunate. And I mean, a lot of it, a lot of it has come from, you know, being, being lucky enough to know people who are, you know, getting rid of stuff. I bought some of it new as well, uh, more of it recently than before. But I mean, in terms of my gateway into it, had Andre not said, you know, you can pay me whenever you've got the money for the, for the CM10s, I probably wouldn't have gotten into this at all. Um, but just, just getting back to the, the TT2, phenomenal DAC, like just absolutely phenomenal. And I've heard... I mean, I recently heard a DAC, which I think combined it would cost about 15 grand because it's like a couple of components you buy for it. I'm very sorry. There's not a chance. It can, I mean, at least in my ears, and I know it's a subjective thing, to my ears, not, not what I want. Um, I do like the day very much. I know you're not as big of a fan, um, but I, I, I'm a, I really like it. Really, really like it. I think it maybe it could be because I heard it in tandem with an M scaler, but whatever came out of it was fantastic. Um, the only other update really to the hi-fi system, I still have exactly the same surround speakers. They suit me fine. It's unlikely I'll ever change that. Um, I, the only other big change I made was I got, I bought Andre's uh, Castle Rock um, AudioQuest cables as well for the two front speakers. And then those are serious, I mean, serious cables. You know, they're like this thick. Um, you know, they, uh, it's like, like snakes laying on the floor and, but they are very, very good. And the, and the other thing is I, I added a, a Niagara 3000. So I still have the 1200, but because of all the cables that I had, I, need, I needed another one. So I thought, what the fuck? I'm just going to get a, <laughs> it's going to get a 3000, which, which is also very, very, very good. Yeah. I haven't had a chance to really see the other ones. Only, only the big one that I managed to get mm -hmm. my hands on at the first opportunity, because I would, I'd bought very much into the hype of those products. If that makes sense. I'd watched all the videos about them and it was just, I was just intrigued if that makes sense. And I've always been big into power conditioning anyway, but there was just something about that. It was like a, are they are they going about it a little bit of a different way, and that was intriguing to me. So I've, I've only had a little bit of time with the set. It's a seven, isn't it? Seven thousand. Yeah, a couple of years yeah. ago. Um, but again, that's that's another area of <laughs> of you know interesting area of hi-fi in terms of power, power delivery, and and, and the effects of the effects of that. And <laughs> what, what do you where do you spend your money first? Should you build the system first, or should you build the system foundation first? And that's that's a really difficult question to answer because it's you know if you're not hearing the maximum of what you own should you be buying something better mm. that's a really interesting quandary there isn't it really if you're not maxing out 
the, the products you already own. Why are you upgrading them? Because you're not even hearing what you already own to the best it can be. So I, I find that a, a very, very interesting question that you know each, each individual audio file is going to answer for themselves. Yeah, 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 no, I agree. I, I, I would definitely say I, I don't, I don't see that, that there's anything wrong with you spending a reasonable amount of money on speaker cables. Like, you know, as, if, if you if you're just putting your system together. I mean, when it comes to Bowers, they should come with a sticker saying "Warning: Keep silver away from these things at all at all costs," because it just it becomes so bright it, it's just fatiguing and it's not it's not pleasant to listen to. But I think my first um, speaker cables were the uh, were the Rocket Thirty Threes, which which I didn't I actually didn't like very much. Um, I still need to swap out the center speaker because that still has the Rocket Thirty Three cable in it. I just don't think it's a good cable at all. Uh, these castle rocks are far too extravagant, <laughs> but I got them at a, at, a, at a good price, so that's why they're in there. Um, but I would definitely say, my, my, if I were buying, if I were putting together something, I would probably concentrate on my speakers and amplification are the are the first thing, then a DAC, then I would start thinking of everything else. The rest you can tweak as you go on. What I do like about uh, AudioQuest power conditioning um, is they seem to not take take the guts out of the music quite as much as other power conditioning i've heard i've heard other power conditioners which might clean it up a lot and they might make the signal sound a lot better but they seem to take the life out of the music a little bit um whereas the music i listen to and again this might be a completely subjective thing i like i like a bit of spice in uh, in what i'm hearing um you know i want some of that i want some of that energy in there you know, so this this is a really interesting thing and again everyone's opinions are exactly and they're all based on your experience exactly what you said my experience of the audio quest niagara was it's a little bit it's quite delicate in its approach if that makes sense you can hear what it's doing but it's not it's not extreme so it's tr- mm. it's tr- i think it's trying to be more even across a wide band i think that's the whole purpose of of the design so as you say not not taking too much away but you could argue that anything you put before a product, anything you put within power, it cannot take away anything from the signal. It can't take away because it's not actually touching the signal. It's all just the power, which I think it's AC, which then gets converted to DC. So if something's coming away with power condition and power products, should you be hearing it in the first place? That's a really, really interesting question because as I say, it's not it's not in the signal path. So it's not. it can't take treble away, it can't take bass away. It can only add or take away kind of noise. Really, that's all. That's all that's happening there, uh, and, and maybe current and, and delivery in that regard. So it, it's a really interesting one, Jackie. It's like yeah, I, I don't know the answer. I'm not. I'm not confessing that I know the answer, but it's mm. one of those questions to me. It's one of those puzzles. It's you know you can think one either way or both. I think for that for that kind of situation, and they're the sorts of things that you can stress over and lose sleep over and lose hair over. This you see why I've uh, not got. <laughs> well, you know the thing is also when you get into cabling and power conditioning, then you get into the 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 bickering fests online or or the stupid videos that you know those i i'll I'll, uh normally i'm pretty fast and loose with who i insult but i'll I'll, i don't want to get you into any trouble but you know that you we i think we all know the people who post you know they paid x amount for this power cable they've done these tests and it's rubbish and it's like well I, i i maybe your testing tells you one thing but my earring tells me something else and i know i'm not imagining it as I said on the the video last time, my girlfriend's not into hi-fi at all. When I when I got my Thunder power cable and I plugged it into the power conditioner, she could immediately hear the difference. Mm. Immediately. When I when I swapped out the Telerium Q cables, which were great for those Castle Rocks, which cost five times as much, she could immediately hear it. You know, so it's not. I don't think it's something that's imperceptible. I, I think there's there is a point where you get to the where the law of diminishing returns kicks in and it's going to become so expensive where you go like, look, the power cable costs as much as most people's hi-fi. Maybe this is not what I'm going to use for my, you know, 500 pound speakers, but it's, um, there's definitely a difference without a shadow of a doubt. And there's definitely certain types of cable that works very well with certain components and certain, certain types that don't. But I mean, I know you. I mean, I'm not. I'm preaching to the converted. Yeah. Oh, Christ. Every single yeah, time yeah, you you yeah, you yeah. post about this on on your channel, like I already know. Okay, here we go. The next yeah. the next comment is going to be snake oil. <laughs> How can you say this, Terry? My measurements told me something else. <laughs> well, this is this is back to you know each to their own. If if, if you don't want to do it, you don't want to do it. And if yeah. you do, you do. I mean, I, w- I would never tell somebody to spend loads of money on something without trying it. But I would suggest they always try it if you can. Always try it because it's ultimately what you like and, and what's going to work for you. And if it doesn't work for you, don't spend the money. It's it's as simple as that. Mm. And it, uh, 
uh, uh, bring up the law of diminishing returns. This is something that's really, really interesting. I remember the first time I went to what HiFi, there was an opportunity to go there and do a, a blind test. And I was there. This is years ago. I was there as quick as as quick as you could put your name in this and this application thing. I was first. It's like I, I, I wanted to see it. And the first question I asked their main technical person was, does the law of diminishing returns exist? And kind of where is it? You know, I, I was trying to think, am I trying to pitch? Are my eyes bigger than my belly, if that makes sense? Am I pitching too high? And the first thing they said to me was, no, the law of diminishing returns doesn't exist. It just keeps on getting better. And I don't know if that was the most clever way to you know, encourage someone to really get into something or if that was genuinely the truth. And it's an interesting one because I think what happens is not the law of diminishing returns. I think HiFi does keep getting better because when you've had the chance to listen to some very big systems, expensive Wilsons, expensive D'Agostinos in big spaces, and this is just at shows where they've had a, maybe a day or two to set it up. When you've heard the, the majesty of HiFi systems like that, it, it, it shows you a whole other level of sound. So what I've ever achieved, it, you know, my system of very, very nice equipment. So if the jump from what our class is very good sound goes up here and I'm sure from up there, it goes up there. Well, where is the law of diminishing returns in that? It's like, mm. you know, these yeah. are very, very big money systems, but the sound they're producing is of a whole another level of majesticness is the word they use. And it's, it's totally correct. So I think what happens with everyone's systems, there is what I call a limiting factor. So that limiting factor might be how much money you've got, how much space, You've got whether, whether you're sharing your room as like a lounge and you can only put speakers on a, on a wooden furniture or you can't you can't have the speakers wider or you put the speakers wider and they're right butted up against the wall. You know, those are all limiting factors that no matter what hi-fi system you put in that room, you can't over overcome those limiting factors, if that makes sense. So I think we hit those before we hit the law of diminishing returns personally. Yeah. And I think that's mistaken as the law of diminishing returns it's like oh I, I can spend a lot more money to get a small benefit well it's because because we've been the system's been held back if that makes yeah, sense yeah, by, yeah, by yeah, these yeah. things that nine times out of ten we probably can't even control or, or we don't know exists it's one of those because you know sometimes you work something out and you think oh wow uh, you know i've worked this out and then people talk about moving speakers by like kind of like a millimeter or an inch and then that unlocks a whole nother level of sound well I, i'm sure what they're talking about is maybe time alignment and other bits and pieces but when you've done all that and you've measured You've done loads of DSP. You've done all these. You just kind of hitting a limit of wow, it, this room's only ever going to let me have sound to this kind of level. If that makes sense, so I just need a bigger room, or I need yeah. I need to sit further away. Or, or well, that that's a consideration like that. for me as well. Like um, as I said, if I if I get the M8, I'm gonna one, I'm gonna need a new Hi-Fi rack. But the, the next thing that happens <laughs> is the the speakers will go out a little bit more than to, yeah. to you know to where they'll probably be in the corner of the of the room, and quite close to the wall. Um, I think that's partly why I don't really, I don't, I, even though I don't have subs right now, I don't really like for bass. Um, if I watch a movie, I, I can, you know, the, the bass is, is pretty significant uh, through that S5. Um, and when I listen to music, it, it's, I would almost say it's, it's, it's exactly where it needs to be. Like, you know, I don't, I like, I like bass to be prominent, but not overpowering. So um, yeah, but I, you're hundred percent right. So my question there is how far off are you from owning those Wilson Chronosonics? <laughs> only only seven hundred and sixty eight thousand dollars. Well, I'm waiting for them to send me some to review. To be honest, it, it, it's I tell you what, something happened to me about a year ago. Wilson Audio contacted me randomly out of the blue, and they asked me if I wanted to review a pair of their speakers. And that you had the, those those tune tots, right? Yeah. Well, obviously, when you get an email come through from Wilson Audio that you're not expecting, and that was such a gratifying. That's probably the most gratifying moment <laughs> I've had so far. It's like, yeah. Wilson Audio have emailed me. What? What is that about? And obviously, I, I would love to have looked at some of the bigger speakers, but you know, the opportunity to review a pair of Wilson speakers was, you know, and they asked me to do it on a desk, which is just I wasn't set up for it at all. And it's like, oh wow, I've now got to do all these things just to make this work. But I, I wasn't going to turn that opportunity down because well, it hasn't it hasn't come again. You know, I've looked at a lot of other nice stuff again, but that was a very uh, gratifying moment that. Uh, you know, all the work you're putting in week after week, a day, in fact, day after day after day. And then, you know, opportunities like that pop up. It's, uh, and you know what? And those are speakers that people criticize them. Are they're only using this driver? They're only using this. Why are they so expensive? And yes, they are extremely expensive. But when you pick up those tune tots in your hands, the difference between them and say, oh, uh, uh, the people that care for less 50 meter are a little bit like it. But the difference between a lot of thousand pound speakers and that is a 10,000 pound speaker, just the weight, the physical weight of that tune top is like mm. this is so 
dead you know and god knows what they're making it out of i don't tell anybody but whether that justifies that huge price increase i'm not saying i i, I wouldn't give a comment on that but you can feel a difference if that makes sense in terms of how that thing is built and, and what's gone into making that ultimately it's still a two-way speaker so the physics of a two-way speaker are always the physics of a two-way speaker but the way that thing is built you can see why it costs a lot of money is, i suppose is what i'm trying to trying to say yeah 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 no i've never I've, I've never heard anything by wilson it's always been one of the brands i would just love to hear um i mean I, clearly i would love to hear the chronosonics although i think that <laughs> might send me to spiraling depression but i'm, I'm e equally keen on hearing those tune uh, those tune tots because yes you're right they're very small they're very expensive i know there's some people that are you know that swear by them so well, you can't um, see the, the thing with that is for, for nine thousand pounds you can buy a lot of other speakers you could buy hmm. seven foot tall floor standards that are going to outperform a stand mount speaker that doesn't do bass below 60 hertz that there is no yeah. you know there is there is no debate in that but you, the person who's buying the tune top doesn't want the seven foot floor stander they don't want that hmm. they want they want a wilson that is small so that that's who that speaker is for back back to the what we were speaking about earlier jackie in terms of kind of understanding why these products exist and who, who they're for and it's i think it's the same with everything there'd be a pro yeah i think some hi-fi is trying to, to be made for everybody if that makes sense and other products are made for specific customers and yeah. sometimes we have to remember that when we're when you're trying to judge value or it's judge it's it's very stuff. similar to, well i think you're hitting the nail on the head as far as the, the value but i think the the other thing is around um it's like it's like cars you know so People will go, why are you spending, you know, 129,000 pounds on that McLaren? Only two people can fit in the front. Okay, well, you can spend, you know, 85,000 on an X5 and you can carry the whole family around and the dog can sit in the boot and what, you know, whatever the case may be. But it's like, well, do, maybe I don't want to <laughs> carry the whole family around and I don't have any friends and all I want is to be able to sit in the front and go really fast. So I think I, you know, it's, it's sometimes I think hi, buying a hi-fi, I think is similar considerations to buying a car. Well, I think it's, it's a luxury good at the end of the day, isn't it? It's a luxury good. So there's a whole other host of things that come along with that brand, yeah. brand loyalty, brand ownership, you know, to say you own a Wilson speaker. Funnily enough, I remember, I remember speaking to a guy once and I asked him what speakers he had. And he, he was, a, I think he was a wealthy guy. I just, you can just tell sometimes. And he said he had Wilson speakers. And I missed this years ago. I remember saying, oh, wow, Wilson's are the speakers that you buy when you've made it in life. And I, I, I always think to me, me saying that to him. And I, he, I think he chuckled to himself inside. I think that was a very gratifying comment yeah. for me to say to him about, you know, oh, wow, he's, uh, you know, he can afford to buy Wilson's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, so one thing I'm pretty sure everyone's going to want to know is uh, what what is on your hi-fi rack at the moment if you want to give me a quick kind of snapshot oh wow jackie mate no, nothing stays on my hi-fi rack for, for long anymore uh, you know what i had my heart set on buying i say i was 40 a couple of months ago i had my heart set on buying a tube amplifier i knew mm. which one i wanted i really wanted it just because i just wanted a tube amplifier with these big glowy big glowy light which which, which one on you top. were you going to go for well it was, it was a line I, I did a calibration for for a customer who'd bought a line magnetic a 219 or something like that it's huge great big thing absolutely huge massive i think it's it weighed like 60 kilograms or something like that and he was powering some uh clips forte fours or 43s i can't remember through them and normally people would, would associate clips with being really kind of brash and party mm. type speakers and through this tube amplifier he had a denifrips terminator dac coming off of a an Auralic streamer and with a mini DSP unit, which is what I was calibrating for, for Direct Live. And this system sounded so sweet and so delicate. As, again, through clip speakers, it had this lovely airy type sound. And I, I remember calibrating this, sitting, sitting there thinking, this sounds absolutely fantastic. I just love, I just love this sound. And then I was there and he wanted me to do several calibrations. So we changed the speakers for some KF LS50 meters. And then the, the, the tube amplifier changed for a Hagel amplifier the top of the range Hagel amplifier. That and the sound five, just, 590. Yeah, the 9,000 pound one. And mm. the sound just wasn't the same. It just was a very different. And once I'd heard that tube amplifier for those clips, you're just like, oh, well, the, the solid state is just nothing would, nothing would get you back to, nothing I could do if that makes sense with the calibration could get us back to mm. that synergy maybe, or just the tube sound. So after that, it's like, oh, I want a bit of that tube sound in my life. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to buy this tube amplifier. And I was eyeing it up, and eyeing it up. And I'm glad I didn't because I would have bought it. It would have sat in a box and I wouldn't have even had a chance to take it out of the box because I, 
it's it's for me it's not a product that's probably right to review other things because it's going to have a it's going to have a character and probably a very strong yeah, character yeah, yeah, yeah. which yeah. is why you would buy it and why you would like it because of that character and when you're trying to review things it makes it really difficult because how, how do you know what for especially for speakers how do you know what speaker's character when your amplifier is putting its own sonic print on it so yeah. it's like, oh, I can't, you know, it'd be one of those things I probably wouldn't even be able to run it in. I wouldn't be able to put enough hours on it to run it in because I just don't have that much time for fun, if that makes sense, for for pleasure listening. It's, it's become very much a work-orientated life for me because people, people probably don't realise is that how many hours goes into putting our video together is unbelievable amounts of hours. All the testing, all the listening, all the comparison, that's a couple of days and you've got scripting, videoing, editing. It's, it's a serious pro- process to put... Uh, no high quality YouTube videos together. I was about to say, I mean, at the level you're doing it at, it for, for sure, you know, and it would take ages. It doesn't leave much time for fun, Jackie. So it's like, yeah, I have my heart, I have my heart on that. So, yeah. but the, the, there are some cracks parts of the system that's been the same, and that's really important. So, the, the computer that I built as a music server, I really like that, and I really rate that, and I've been very fortunate um, to know JCat uh, and JPlay. So I've got my hands on, I've got to play with JCat's like latest uh, network cards and USB cards, and the, the difference that type of approach can make to how a computer sounds. You can make a computer sound like a, a pretty high-end hi-fi source by paying attention to these details. So that, that bit always stays the same. I've been, I've been very fortunate to, I've got a lot of Isotech mains conditioning that very, very good stuff. I've been lucky to, to have that. So kind of like the core and two MQ cables and stuff like that, that, that core bit always stays the same. But the bit that people are probably excited about, the speakers and the amplifiers, well, that's changing hmm. all, all the time, really. Um, and any 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 kind of shootouts or anything like that coming up? Well, I've got another one. Funnily enough, I mean the the whole idea was the first shootout I did was up to six hundred and fifty pounds. Mm. Then when I started looking at a second one, it's like where do I pitch the next price point? Because when you step stand mount speakers up to over a thousand, there is a massive range between say a thousand pounds and about th- probably about two and a half three thousand pounds. So how how do you compare a three thousand pound speaker to a one thousand pound one? You can't. That's too mm, bigger mm. because I feel like if you're spending if you're spending a thousand pounds, you might be able to afford twelve hundred, maybe or thirteen hundred. But there's no way you're going to be able to afford three thousand. That's just a that's just a completely different price point. So, I, and there were some really interesting ones that were around sixteen hundred and two thousand pounds. But even two thousand and a thousand pounds, that to me, that's too bigger, too bigger price difference to compare. So what what I did was split it up, and I've got about seven speakers here that are between. 1300s and 2000 pounds so i'm going to be doing another another comparison oh, awesome. between those because again that's like more diversity again there's some really interesting designs in that so i'm, I'm just i'm funny enough i'm just waiting to get some different legs hype for speaker stands so i'm, I'm using atacama's nexus their brand new nexus speaker stands which for mm. 120 pounds they are ridiculously good the time you fill them up with Atabyte, so it might be about two hundred pounds. They're, mm-hmm. they're just rock solid stands; they just don't move, and they're dead. It's like, well, that's that's just. I'm sure you can get better, but that's as close to perfect as you need for less than two hundred pounds. It's insane, insane good value for money. Mm-hmm. So I'm just waiting for a slightly different height, because typically one of the speakers that I've got, which are the um, Arendelle 1723. They're about know, six foot tall for stand mounts. They're huge, great big things. So they need a different height of stand. So I thought, well, I'll start with them and then I'll change the stand once, keep the stand exactly in the same position for all the others, if that makes sense. Because it's, again, if you're moving stands around, you're hearing differences, other differences. So it's imp- I think it's important if you're doing a group test to keep as much exactly the same as possible. So all you're changing is the one factor, not not multiple variables that's about as scientific as i can get i hope i hope that's people agree with that as a as a process no, i i i would agree i think that i mean the, the the cool thing about what you're building is as well you you know is kind of this reference library where if somebody is starting off i don't know whether you're planning to do it but like if i if i were in your shoes what i would do is maybe have like a you know again you a sort of a you set a budget for an amplifier and then maybe set a budget for a DAC and then have that shoot out so somebody can go and say okay i've got 1500 to spend I can watch Terry's video about, you know, entry level uh, bookshelf speakers, um, you know, and then entry level DAX, entry level um, amplifiers. That um, would be really good, actually, Jackie. That's, that's, it's just, yeah, difficult. It, it, it's re- it's not hard. It would just be a case of doing it all at once. So I'd have to get mm-hmm. loads of budget DAX in and then look at them all and try and pick one out from that. It's, you know, that, that that is really useful consumer advice. Back, back to what I was saying before, it's like there's quite a lot of youtube reviews out there which are and i used to do them as well it's just one review on one product 
without much comparison. And it is the comparisons. It is very useful. It is very helpful, I think. Um, and, and sometimes just just the straight comparison one to another shows you things you might not just hear if you just listen to one to one thing. Like uh, I've just looked at two, actually three different DACs, quite expensive ones. And they're all good. That's the problem. They're all good. And you could get very excited about all of them. But when, mm. you, when you listen to one, listen to the other, well, that one's good for this. That one's slightly better in that way, but not as good there. So it's, and, and the thing is, I suppose it's, it, all that really matters is how you then integrate that with the rest of the system. So if your DAC is a bit brighter or a bit more about space, but then you balance that space with a more saturated amplifier or speakers, well, that, that's what people talk about is synergy, isn't it, really? It's, mm. it, to me, it's always like a balancing act. But I think true synergies, people say that if you've got really good components that work together, they sound like more than the sum of their parts. I've always struggled with that a little bit because I always feel like setting up things well gives you a sound that's more than the sum of its parts. But I have, I've had some experience recently where you think, oh, wow, those two, those two things do seem to work better together than others. So it's I'm starting to come around to the whole synergy idea, but I'm, I'm still very... Uh, I don't know. <laughs> if, if, iffy about it. I, I, no, it's not that. It's, it, say, for example, and there is more, it is more complex than this, but if you've got a bright amplifier and you put it with warm speakers, well, then you end up in the middle. Hmm. So what happens if you've got like a, a warm amplifier and you put it with bright speakers? I can't remember. You end up in the middle. So e either way, you end up in the middle. Why not just buy products that are in the middle? And hmm. the interesting thing is when you buy a lot of products that are neutral in the middle, it doesn't seem to sound as good as when you have one either end and you bring it to the middle so it's really i don't know it's it's uh it's a very well, like i said i mean you you have that experience with i oh, i have certainly have that experience with bowers like i said at the start of the conversation you need to be so careful with what you pair them with but if you pair them with the right stuff phenomenal i so mean you can, again you kind of have with a with a diamond series you have now custom-made amps for it which, which are those mishis they were made with the diamonds in mind and they just they work so well together well, this is this is this is it. So pe people will buy the kit that they like, and then try and balance the sound. Yeah, yeah. To make it work for them, which is, uh, and and you can look at it two different ways. You know, should should I be buying the sound that I like, or should I just buy the products that I like and then make it work? Uh, ultimately, you've got a, you've, there's got to be a reason. There's got to be a motivating factor to spend money on these things. And it doesn't matter if you're spending five hundred fifty or or fifty million or whatever. It's you've got you've got to really love it, haven't you? You've got to love. And for some people, it's about how it looks. I'm not really that sort of person. To me, it's more about how it sounds. I couldn't really care less how it looks. If it looked weird, sounded amazing. I've I've I seen some stuff still. that looks like dog shit, though. I mean, I can't remember <laughs> the, the the brand, but it literally looks like they've like 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 the thing is incomplete. It's it, it's got like like Novax tape around the around the around the kind of main driver. I think you you'll know what I mean when you when you if you if I send you a picture, it looks like such garbage. Um, Whereas again, the Bowers looks great. The, the those those Antillians, I mean, they they look seriously imposing. It's like you're in a fucking HR Giga <laughs> art museum. But what, what's, what's the Antillians, Jackie? I'm getting confused. Oh, not Antillians, sorry, the Tridents. Oh, um, I, I haven't seen those yeah. yet. I haven't seen those in the flesh. That that's oh, dude, they're they're I've enormous. The they yeah. so so Andre's roof is probably about probably about nine foot high. Um, they're about they stand at a I think about six and a half to seven feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they are enormous. They nearly they're nearly all the way up to the roof. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, all right, my man. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, hopefully people learned a bit from it, and I I just fucking love talking about this anyway. And it's it's nice to kind of. Be, be able to talk to you where you know there's not 900 people you know baying for your autograph and stuff at a hi-fi show so uh... <laughs> <Shut up. laughs> you know what but, but just this is funny my, my partner she said to me go into i said go to hi-fi show people stop and talk to me she's like terry the day i'll be impressed is when someone stops you in the street and, and wants to talk to you not a hi-fi show that doesn't count it's when they see you in the street and recognize you it's like oh, well that's never that's never going to happen jackie so uh, oh, i was no mate, but, <laughs> uh, if i if i had not seen you at the hi-fi show i undoubtedly would have done that so. <laughs> <laughs> but but as as i said um open invitation mate when uh i think once once let's let's let, let, once i've decided what i'm definitely going for as far as amplification is concerned then definitely come you know come over we'll uh we'll get the, the barbecue fire going and i shall uh i shall employ your services to um uh, to get get everything pro you know properly calibrated yeah 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 so. i'd say it'd just, it'd just be nice to come and see you man i, I like going to people's houses and, and spending time with them in their home and their systems and just talking to because again it's like this you're talking to a like-minded individual which you know let's let's be honest 
I, I don't have any high five friends in my home or local to me that I can talk about this stuff to. So it's yeah, it's a, it is a bit of a solo pursuit in that regard, isn't it? So it's but it isn't. It doesn't have to be if you reach out and speak to you know other people. So yeah, no, for sure. All right, brother. Take care of yourself. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Okay, bye bye.
Thank you so much to Terry from Pursuit of Perfect System for joining me to chew the fat over one of my favorite topics in the world to talk about. Uh, and I hope that along the way, all of you were entertained and you learned something as well. Uh, make sure that you subscribe to his channel, Pursuit of Perfect System. Really cool reviews, very informative. Uh, and I, as I've uh, mentioned, you know, over the course of our conversation, I learned an awful lot from watching it as well. So, um, yeah, great talking to him. Uh, and uh, who knows, maybe he'll be back on again at some point to do a uh, to do a sequel. Also, if you live in the UK, and this is not a plug of any sort, uh, I'm just mentioning it because these are cool guys, and uh, you know I think that they uh, they deserve the support. Uh, head over to Nintronics uh, if you're interested in buying any sort of hi-fi gear. Um, they have a variety of uh, of brands and products to suit every pocket, and um, you know you will be well taken care of if you go knocking on there. And also, they're one of the few hi-fi stores that when you turn up in your Marduk t-shirt, they don't look they don't look at you like you're about to rob the place. Uh, also, come back next week uh, because I will be talking to Katie Irizari, PR. Uh, mistress of uh, Season of Mist Records, uh, not somebody who holds back on her opinion by any stretch of the imagination. And I think if you like the Alan Averill com uh, conversation I had, uh, I suspect you are going to enjoy this one also. I am now going to play out with uh, a song that is guaranteed to clear out any demo or listening room on the face of the earth. Uh, this is a track called The Palm, The Eye, and The Lapis Lazuli by Melikesh. I will see all of you bad motherfuckers again next week. <laughs> 